Welcome to another episode of the Local Dive Podcast, where we share our deep and shallow musings about Christ, the church, and culture. This is Alex Scott, joined by Dean and Sarah and Ashlyn Portero. How you guys doing? Hello, hello. Ready to roll. Oh, there it goes. The old <laughs> can pop. I'm here, too. Sweet. <laughs> I came with my can already the, popped. The Diet there Coke sip across the table from me. There you go. Um, we're excited to... Uh, dive into another episode and uh, today we've got a bit of a controversial topic <clears throat> where we are going to be talking all about that was a drum roll if anybody couldn't pick that up alcohol alcohol and keep in mind it's only controversial for baptists and some pentecostals yeah no other christians in the world this is controversial for us that's why you talk about it yeah so we are going to spend the majority of our time in the deep dive talking about the controversy or lack thereof maybe of alcohol. But before we do, uh, we're going to spend some time in the shallow end talking about our favorite songs that mention or are about alcohol. Uh, so who's going first? Favorite song about alcohol. All right, I'll go first. Um, so I feel like most of my favorite songs about alcohol are country songs because most country songs involve alcohol in some way. Uh, but I'm going to pick a few that like stand out because so I'll Kenny Chesney, for example, if you've heard one Kenny Chesney song about like the Island Tiki bar drinks and whatever, those are all fun. That's like, you can make a whole beach playlist out of it. It's good times. Don't pretend like you don't listen to it. Let's just all acknowledge that they're fun songs. But my favorite Kenny Chesney song about alcohol is you and tequila. That's a different song. I feel like he sings that with Grace Potter. So that's a good one. Um, I'm not going to sing it because that just, we'd need to end the podcast right there, but you can look it up. You and Tequila by Kenny Chesney. Um, and I also like major throwback strawberry wine by Deanna Carter. Some good nineties country vibes there. Thank you. I'm very proud of myself. That's what I was raised on. So those are two. Um, I mean, there's a million, like all the, you know, Toby Keith, like just crazy song. Oh, Beer for My Horses is another good one by Toby Keith. Is that, is that Toby and, Keith? And Willie. Yeah. Yes, and Willie, yeah. I was like that. I knew that was like a medley. Um, so those are three. Those are three that I got. There's there's obviously all the ones that are just like, oh, yeah, alcohol floating on floating down a river. There's a girl in a truck. Like, we'll just lump all those into one category. But those are ones that stand out to me. Every <laughs> country song references it somewhere. And then, uh, yeah. and, and then church. Yeah, at the end of it. Right, yeah. and, and, yeah. God, and God bless America. Yeah. <laughs> my, mine is, my all-time favorite is Chris, Chris Cagle's What Kind of Gone? Because I just oh. think it's just a really kind of clever song, how it's written. Because basically what happens is his girlfriend tells him that she's gone. Mm-hmm. So he asks the question, what kind of gone are we talking about here? Uh-huh. And he says in the song, is it a whiskey night or just a couple beers? <laughs> so like, you are go. you like gone forever or are you just like mad at me? <laughs> and, you're, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and you're coming back. So I've always thought that was a pretty... A pretty clever song. And then, um, of course, there's Brad Paisley's Alcohol oh, yeah. uh, song, uh, which is kind of like, I guess, a tribute to alcohol around the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gets a, France gets a shout out in Milwaukee and Lynchburg, Tennessee, and, <laughs> yep. and everything else. And then one more um, is kind of, I would say, maybe the most popular country song of the 90s is Friends in Low Places by Garth mm-hmm. Brooks. Mm-hmm. I got friends in low places where the whiskey drowns and the beer chases my blues away. Yep. That That's was a like- sensation. And, and every... And all the people, the Baptist people, even love that song, which is very interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that some, too. Yeah, don't act like you haven't raised a glass at a country concert in a stadium to that song. That's definitely, like, a requirement, I think, at every Southern wedding, to to play that song. Oh, my gosh. So oh, true. yeah. The reception? Oh, yeah. yeah. So true. Um, <clears throat> the, the song that, at least lately, that I've been uh, kind of digging that is related to alcohol is I Owe You a Beer by Tyler Reeve. It's a much, like, lesser known uh I yeah, I don't you know, think country I've heard that artist, song. but um, it's basically, you know, like this guy broke up with his girlfriend, and so he then like Tyler Reeve get, gets the girl, and so he's like, I owe you a beer for you know, kind of helping me. Uh, <laughs> Fair trade, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, sounds really positive towards women. <laughs> yeah, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not knocking note. you. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just making a joke. Misogynist yeah. Alex. Yeah. <laughs> like verse two is, you're probably thinking I should hate you, but she's mine now, so I'm a thank you. Like you know, it's a cheer, cheers to you for cheers to that. As Rihanna would say, I'll drink to that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, and then what? Who sings the song? Uh, I think it's alcohol. Brad Paisley, where he's like, you know, making white people dance. Uh, it's hilarious. It's so true. Yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say it's it's a. A, a social lubricant, a dance floor lubricant that everybody needs that's not, you know, maybe naturally gifted in that area. So um, that's just, I don't know, that line always makes me crack up. But 
as we as we think through some of these songs, does anybody have any others before we kind of move on and and actually engage this topic in a meaningful way? The thing that makes me laugh about some like songs about alcohol is I'm like, and I mean, I, I don't know this. I I imagine that if you actually took the song literally, like I don't know, maybe some people do, but like I think about. Okay, that song, Straight Tequila Night, is that by John Anderson? I think so. That okay. sounds right. It's either it's him like, or Sammy Kershaw, I, one of the two. Yeah, one Anderson of the two. sounds right. Yeah. So songs like that always make me laugh because it's like the words are, don't ask her on a straight tequila night. And I'm like, I've never had a straight tequila night, <laughs> but you wouldn't be able to ask me anything. Like I wouldn't be able to form a coherent thought. So it's like songs like that are always funny to me because I'm like, wait, if we actually literally applied this, like that's concerning to me. Like so I just I had to voice that. Sometimes I listen to the songs and I'm like, I get that this is like not literal, but you know, I'm I'm was. worried about that woman <laughs> that you that you could actually engage her in a conversation on the straight tequila night. And if you really wanted to get the answer you were hoping for, ask her on the straight tequila night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. yeah, maybe that's why. Yeah. Uh, well that's like Jake Owen's song, uh, you can't drink all or you, yeah, you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. It's like does anybody really want to drink? I mean, I don't know. Oh, I guess people. St. Patrick's but... Day is all I can think of. Yeah. Oh <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. That just in, sounds yeah, in Florida Tallahassee. State. Oh my word. Yeah. Sounds yeah. miserable. So, so one. Speaking of, we're in Tallahassee. It's our mission field, right? Yeah. So, um, one song that comes to mind for me, one extra one is it's not like your example of, of not a very known song, but it's worth like googling and, and listening to. It's a song, "The Honky Tonk in the Altar," and in the song, the chorus says that we all fall somewhere between. The honky tonk in the altar, hmm. and I, I don't think we all do, but in our own sure. ways we do. You know, of, of our sin and, and of and of grace, right? But mm-hmm. I, I think that that really explains a lot of our mission field and cultural Christianity in the South. Is a lot of people that, again, they're not atheists, you know, mm-hmm. but they do fall down some. They fall somewhere between, you know. Yeah. They're, they're called the Christ haunted South. You know, the idea of Jesus. Mm-hmm. But I'm getting too deep too quick here. But <laughs> the idea of, of, of Jesus, but also like that that draw to the things of this world mm-hmm. and. And that type of thing. It's also the song on the radio right now. It's like I'm not I'm not like all Jim Beam. I'm not holy water. I'm somewhere yeah, in between or something that. like that. Yeah, yeah. that really is reality. Yeah, right. and Southern culture totally just allows you to kind of live in that. You know what what we call sort of the in between, which yes. is really just like just justifying. You know, to your point, still living like the world. Mm-hmm. You know, but it's, yeah, it's just interesting how that can kind of be culturally acceptable. You know. You can figuratively double fist Jesus and your your drink Ooh, of choice. That's a good, to, that's and, a good and visual. Live Alex. in live in the the tension that tr- you know <laughs> trying to make those two things compatible. Uh, Can't but, double fist but Jesus in the world. No, nope. um, Alex Scott. So, Scott, eight thirty. <laughs> yep, there we go. Um, so as we as we transition into the deep end, one of the things that we want to or deep dive, one of the things we want to talk about is that so oftentimes, like as we've talked about with even some of these songs, like alcohol isn't intended to do the things that it does now right it's not supposed to make white people dance it's not supposed to be what you need to become social it's not um what you you know it's not a truth serum it's not Mm -hmm. okay you know asking her on a straight tequila night to get the answer that you want so as we think about this from a biblical and a christian perspective we start with the Bible. How is wine or alcohol viewed in the scriptures and how can we help frame this entire conversation in a way that actually does help people? Well, I think it begins by really the entire storyline of the scriptures when it comes to idolatry, which is taking good things. I think Keller was the first one to word it like this about idolatry, taking usually good things like God make, gave us wine. Wine's a good thing in the Bible and making it a God thing. Hmm. or abusing its actual purpose of what it was made for. And that's where the warnings come from in the scriptures about what, what happens when we take something and take it out of its place. And mm-hmm. we can do that with, we can just go on a list of all things. You know, I mean, like, for example, like, there, I mean, how many gifts of God are there that we've abused? Uh, I mean, I'm not saying an example, but like, I mean, like, I think of sex as an example. That's mm-hmm. not quite the same thing. It's not a perfect, uh, it, it might, it's not apples and oranges, but it's not apples and apples either. Right. Uh, where, you know, a good thing that God has given us, but how often have we abused that and taken it outside of his design, outside of what's supposed to be? It doesn't make sex bad. It means that we've, we're the ones who have altered God's design for it. Again, it's not apples to apples, but that's an example of mm-hmm. of something like that. And I would say that alcohol is, uh, is similar. But alcohol, I, use, I mean, like, I don't mean like taking whiskey shots. You know, we don't see that in the scriptures. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 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 I'm, glad they used, I, I'm not really convinced any otherwise that taking like shots at the bar is anything other than getting for the purpose of getting drunk. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would say the, the things that like, we see in the scriptures, like we see wine, we see, you know, th- those type of things. And 
I think it's the abuse issue of it that is the problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point, Dean, that we can look at a lot of different examples of idolatry in the scriptures. And I think where alcohol becomes interesting, because you could even, I mean, especially, I'm just going to say, especially in Southern Baptist life, you hear this sometimes, that we can talk about um, drunkenness and abuse of alcohol, but we don't talk about like abuse of food, you know, and and over and like in, when we're talking about indulgence, you know, mm-hmm. indulging in food and, and other things that are bad for our bodies. I think where alcohol, um, just in a practical sense, becomes extra dangerous is because it is mind altering, you know. And so, I mean, it, Paul says, you know, don't get drunk on wine that leads to debauchery. And so that's it, I'm not saying that you can't get <laughs> that your mind can't be altered by too much food, but, but, but again, I think that's where you have to say, okay, but that doesn't make that type of overindulgence mm-hmm. like not sinful. It just is different, and and sins have consequences. And so, some of the implications of alcohol of alcohol abuse, you know, or, or overindulgence can be dangerous and can lead us on to other sins that you know maybe other behaviors don't. Again, I'm not trying to you know, to parse that out and say that those things are less sinful. But I do think to your point, Dean, we have to be careful about at the end of the day, our, our call is to receive good gifts from God that he gives us, but not to make those things that we worship or that we rely on, um, for, you know, for flourishing in life because, you know, God is the only person, um, the, you know, the, the way that we, that we do flourish in life. So. Yeah, I think when when I think about this, I mean, so on one hand, right, that like the psalmist says that wine makes the heart glad, and that, that that's from the Lord, sure. mm-hmm. and so I think you have to take that at at face value and say, okay, like wine is meant to, I don't want to say produce joy, but in a sense, you know, it's it's to be enjoyed. Like it it, it can have, I'll say, positive benefits. It also can have serious serious negative consequences if you know uh, if if abused as almost anything can, right? Like the abuse of anything can lead to, you know, the abuse of food Mm -hmm. can lead to, while maybe significantly different, you know, in terms of potential ramifications, it still can have serious consequences. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, but, but it is meant to be enjoyed while at the same time, Ashlyn, to your point, like, and, you know, it's not, and Dean, to your point about it kind of being, becoming an idol and becoming a God thing, it's not meant to replace something that like our relationship with the Lord should. Yeah. It's not supposed to be a stress reliever. It's not supposed to be a, 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 you know, a a finder of joy. Mm -hmm. It's just supposed to be a, a drink to enjoy, Yeah, you know, with, with with your friends or whoever it might be. And also I think it's important we talk about how how the scriptures also elevate self-control as important and maturity as important, right? And, And moderation as like signs of maturity that you can do those things. That's not talked about enough. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, I, I think one of the things in our culture right now, and, and this happens in Baptist life, especially when it comes to alcohol, but on the larger scale, it's hard to have conversations because let's say maybe in, in some circles, we try to have a conversation about race and you have some questions or just some clarification points. You can get shut down really, really fast, right? Because it's just one of those like taboo topics. That, like if you're not saying this exact thing, you can really get shut down and it, and it hurts real conversation from happening. Mm-hmm. I'm thankful for those who will have, you know, listen to other voices, real mm-hmm. conversations. With alcohol in a lot of like conservative evangelical circles, you can't even really have a conversation about it because it gets shut down immediately. Mm-hmm. It's just like, it's terrible, it's unwise. It's, it's like, okay, but it's in the Bible. So can we please like talk about this? Uh, and it makes it where, um, where sadly, we can't have mature conversations about alcohol. I know at the very beginning we had some fun, talked about some songs that alcohol, alcohol are in. And that was also to set us up to mention that these country songs are – presenting alcohol in a way it was never intended by God to be given to us. That's one of the reasons why we did that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that we need to find a place where we can have a mature, you know, conversation because if we're really being honest for most people, it's just a cultural vestige of the geographical South mm-hmm. when it comes to more conservative, more to fundamental type circles. And it's, it's unfair and it's, it's really dishonest to not allow other Christian brothers and sisters to be able to just express their opinions about it without this is more in pastor world than actual like church member world mm-hmm. uh, where you get marginalized you know and, and you immediately get almost disinvited from things because of alcohol yeah. I mean like a barely a third tier issue you know for Christians and, and I just think that we need to talk about it more yeah I grew up in a in a Presbyterian church and we had uh, it was a pretty large church but we had a good relationship with um, really all the senior pastors that were, you know, I think we had kind of three oh, as, as I grew up over you know 18 years or so in that church. And um, we, we grew up going to their house and I saw them responsibly using alcohol. 
And I didn't really know it was a thing. I thought it was just like a joke that Baptists like don't drink and don't dance. Um, and so, you know, coming up in a Presbyterian church where the view on this is completely different. I mean, in the sense that uh, drunkenness absolutely is a sin. And, and they would have said that, you know, from the get go. Mm-hmm. Um, but to see alcohol as this overly evil kind of thing. It was just really interesting to me um, what, once I kind of entered Southern Baptist life to see the, I don't want to say the villain maybe it, it, it's become. It's for some. Yeah. Um, you know, and so it, it's just, I was kind of just, con- honestly, was confused by it. I was like, oh, this is really, this is really a thing. The people are, you know, and I, I think sometimes it's easy to talk in both generalizations and then like to also lump in, you know, one person who's been seriously affected by the, the misuse or the mistreatment of alcohol uh, and, and, and that's not to make light of what those people have experienced or have gone through because um, alcohol is certainly linked to tragedy. Like there's, there's no denying that, but at the same time, you can't, you can't just say, because maybe, you know, uh, my opinion, at least you can't say because one terrible thing has happened, alcohol is evil and should be eradicated forever. Yeah. So I, I think that if you believe that it's unwise like at all costs, like period, no exceptions, unwise uh, for any Christian to drink alcohol ever. We're talking glass of wine with dinner, you know, beer watching football, whatever it might be. Okay, that is fine. I mean, that is an, that is a legitimate opinion to have. And I'm guessing you drew that opinion from past experience, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you, you could say your, your mother was an alcoholic or you had a good friend that got killed by a drunk driver, you know, a th- thing, thing, or you have a, a lineage in your family and it makes you nervous or – you know, just on and on and on, you know, that you have, you visited rehab too many times to counsel people or, or maybe you, yes. I mean, I, I'll, all that is yes and amen. That is not an absolute truth. That means that every single Christian has to abide by that. Mm-hmm. And they might even say, okay, yes, I agree with that. Okay, well then act like it and don't make it a, a litmus test for fellowship or legitimacy or inclusion or anything like that in your circles over an issue that the majority of global Christianity would not side with you on, mm-hmm. would not agree with you on. And I think that's where we need to be honest about it is to say, if we're like the only, like our kind of tribe we're in, and it's a big tribe, so there's lots of different fragments in it, uh, but if, if we're the, like, some of the only Christians in all the world <laughs> who believe this, uh, then we got to go, okay, how much this is cultural mm-hmm. and how much this is actually convictional? And we need to have, again, like I keep using the words honest conversations, we need to be able to talk about that. So like if, you know, I, I went to, I was invited to dinner one time at a, at a PCA pastor's house. And while I was there, there was a bunch of people there, and they they had wine on the table, and they had you know beer on the table, and and, and those type of things, and people it wasn't a thing. I, but like if that would have happened at a Baptist pastor's house, I mean, oh my word! I mean, mm-hmm. you would you if someone and it got out. I mean, you would have had to, you know, you'd gotten basically almost called to be kicked out of your association or something like that. Yeah. And it just shows how incredibly legalistic it has become, and how we it's it's impossible to navigate and critically think through because people won't allow the conversation to happen go ahead i think something too that's interesting and when we're just thinking about this as a discipleship issue so maybe like zooming in you know into kind of the the role of alcohol in the believer's life um we when i hear like within church circles the conversations about alcohol a lot of times it's in the extremes and so it's kind of like, no, you you know, we should never tolerate it. Alcohol is only bad. Or, you know, and if you drink, then it leads immediately to, you know, drunkenness and broken lives. And, and we have seen that. So we have to acknowledge that. Like, we have to acknowledge that as with many other things, it's something to, you know, be approached with responsibility and self-control. And that it does have, you know, again, as many other things, it does have the, um, it, you know, it's, it's something that we have to be careful with, like, mm-hmm. right. It's, it's a, it's a, a gift that we can receive from God, but it is also something that we have to treat with care. We can't assume that we are, um, you know, that we are God, that we are able to, to, to handle everything, um, with complete, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm trying to say, you know, with, with complete knowledge. Like we have to, we have to remember that we are capable of sin, Yeah, I guess. Um, but I really think that for the average believer, I, again, acknowledging that there are, there are extremes to this, that alcoholism is real, all of those things. But for a lot of people, the, the thing that we, I think, have to be paying more attention to is that there's, for a lot of people, not as much of a risk of, like, 
I might be an alcoholic, but it's like the line between like sober and drunk, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's for for the average person when we're talking about the discipling the average person in our church. I think that's the struggle or the just the the issue that most people, if we got down to it, would would run into is like if I'm at a concert with my friends and I'm buzzed. Like, what does that mean for the life of the believer? You know what I'm saying? So yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, good. that's a good I question. think we don't talk about that a lot. And I think that's where, you know, again, we, when we are, are thinking about growing into Christ likeness, we want to ever be growing in the fruits of the spirit and to be exhibiting self-control and wisdom and, um, you know, all of those things. And so, yeah, I, I just, that's just a thought that I think sometimes we, there's, there's this one conversation about like how it the the philosophies we take on it in terms of people leading churches and and it can become a litmus test based on like what you you know your whatever your view on alcohol is but there's also a very practical issue of for most people they're wrestling with you know sometimes i drink too much Mm -hmm. and i'm not an alcoholic i'm not a teetotaler you know but i drink alcohol and it's and i sometimes cross the line and so that i think that's where like if we speak more into that on a one-on-one level that's opportunity um, for for growth and I think that's you know I I just think that that is actually the one of the main issues that's going on while we're over here sometimes trying to like you know parse words about about alcohol yeah that's the real life ministry yeah like that's the real things that are happening that the the average church member has no idea that there's like a fight about <laughs> whether or not you should partake right mm-hmm. you know at all and so the I appreciate you bringing that up because that really isn't uh, maybe Ephesians 5 comes to mind you're talking about being the buzz at a concert idea you know, Ephesians 5, where um, we're told that don't get drunk with wine. This is the um, CSB version because I'm a certified Southern Baptist. Mm, of uh, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. Okay, that's mm-hmm. what being drunk is going to lead to. Mm-hmm. Then it makes a contrast, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. In other words, what alcohol would normally cause your mind to do, to, to and rather the Spirit should be the one that's filling our mind and empowering our lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that, that that's a critical conversation for maturity and discipleship is how do I navigate through that? Because like to me, a Christian who's trying to live out that reality in their life should never have to call a cab mm-hmm. because yeah. they drank too much yeah. somewhere. Or they, they should never have to say, hey, do you, hey, my, hey, friend, will you drive? You know, what we've done instead in our culture is we've elevated asking for a designated driver as like this amazing moral thing, mm-hmm. like this right. accomplishment of like applause worthy. Which for the world, okay, yes, please don't drive if you've been drinking. Right. But for the Christian, that should not be a reality because we should not let alcohol do to our minds to the point where we're impaired. Because that's, mm-hmm. that that's not what God designed it to be for us. Uh, so, But it, it's, it stretches throughout the scriptures. I mean, Jesus I mean, turned water into wine yeah. at a wedding. And the people couldn't believe it. And they said, normally, you give us like the good wine first. And what do they mean by that is you get you know, intoxicated. Mm -hmm. And that's what people normally do. And then once they're drunk, you can give them bad wine Mm -hmm. and they're not going to notice. Right. They're like, you gave us the good wine at the end. (laughs) Like what's going on (laughs) with this? You know? And Jesus there is not, you know, is not advocating for drunkenness by any means. Uh, Rather, um, it's a miracle. I mean, there's a lot, that's a whole sermon itself of what Jesus did that day at that wedding. Mm -hmm. um, But the reality is that, that wine was present. Now, was again, was it tequila shots? Of course it wasn't. You know, was it nickel beer night at Potbelly's? Of course it wasn't. <laughs> you know, but but it was it was not grape juice either. Because if it was grape juice, then it'd be really confusing in the Bible when you hear people say, don't get drunk. It's like, what does that word mean? Right. Like, what are you talking about? So I, I think that Jesus also said, you know, talked about cutting our, you know, our arm off if it causes us to sin. So for people that can't handle it, you know, mm-hmm. and can't do it in a responsible, by responsible, I mean, like self-control, that, that yeah. fruit of the spirit, uh, then I would say don't drink. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, if, if you can't handle it, don't do it. Mm-hmm. It's not because why, why sin? Like, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to walk into sin. Mm-hmm. So someone might go, well, then is it worth it at all? Like, again, that is, that is maybe not, but for the, for, that's an individual Christian liberty conviction. And we need to trust the Bible enough to let the Bible be the Bible. And us not add things onto it. If we're going to be the people of inerrancy and these type of things, we need to believe in sufficiency too. And that's what it is for me. Is I, I could, I, I could never, ever, ever drink a, a, a sip of alcohol again. It would not matter at all to me. Yeah. It really wouldn't. Um, and I don't drink that often, anyways. Um, I'm just being honest here. Like, and this will probably ca- cost me seven speaking engagements, but I don't care. I'm a pastor in Tallahassee, right? So, um, but it's not it's not important enough, you know. But it's a sufficiency issue, and that's why I talk about it, not because I care at all about alcohol. But because it's a sufficiency of scripture issue, and I want to be about the Bible enough, but I don't force things into the scriptures that aren't there, and let individual believers have their own 
personal convictions and liberty to make mature decisions for themselves. I yeah. think too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think like a, as we think about really kind of both conversations, like for the individual believer who maybe struggles with overindulging and drinking and the teetotaler who thinks you're absolutely bananas if you think it's okay to, you know, have a drink. Like, really, I think this conversation that we're having is sort of the middle ground and the way to have these conversations because, you you know, and, and I, I think that's sometimes, too, where this conversation gets lost, at least in the, some of the teetotalers' minds, is that it's like, well, it always leads to sin or it always leads to, you know, kind of the worst possible extreme conclusion when in the reality is like it's not now are there people who who do yes but like more often than not it's the person who overindulges occasionally on the weekend that we need to speak to and we need to say and like you said you know if, if your hand causes you to sin cut it off like just it's not worth it like it's it you know your holiness is more important than your happiness or that's that where you turn yeah. Like if you turn to alcohol yeah. to be, if I got to go around God, not to God for the things I'm looking for in my life. Yeah. The Christian should never yeah. need a drink. Like exactly. at the end of the day, oh, I just need a drink. You know, like that should not be the way that we relieve stress, that we look for an outlet where we find, you know, happiness and, and, and fulfillment. You know, that should be in Christ. And we can say that about anything. Yes. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. You can say that about a piece of chocolate cake. Like, you Ooh, know, praise the Lord. I was going to say like, in the sanctuary <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a big fan of chocolate cake, but I'm just saying like, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be going to that when you're stressed, when you're in need of, you know, emotional comfort. Like that's when we should be turning to the Lord at the same time, chocolate cake and whiskey are things to be enjoyed that are from the Lord. If we can do it in a way that's responsible. And I just think like this conversation is sort of the conversation that both people need to have. Like you shouldn't be sinning. At the same time, it's not a sin to drink if you're doing it in the way that the Bible has set up very clear, very defined guardrails for uh, for the for the believer. I think, too, something that just comes to my mind when we talk about alcohol is the role of community in that. So alcohol can be, I mean, like gathering with friends over a dinner and having a drink, you know, having a glass of wine or, or whatever. It doesn't have to be wine, but, you know, just having a drink with friends. That can be a great you know, as we kind of see at the, you know, the wedding at Cana, like that can be a great way to just enjoy and celebrate, you know, to add something to, um, and maybe that's a good way to say it, to add something to, you know, a, a gathering of, you know, merriment and friendship and whatever it is that you're celebrating. It's not the focal point, right? Like we're not all getting together to like have a bender, you know, but but we're, we're gathering to celebrate and wine or alcohol is going to be present um, in the way that, you know, maybe nice food is or, you know, or, or whatever else. I mean, it can be a nice non-alcoholic drink, you know, but the way that we kind of bring something like that in um, to, to kind of add to an environment, but, but that's sort of shared in community. And so I, I think there's a relationship between alcohol and community because you can also be in a community that really enables, you know, sin and, and drunkenness through alcohol. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, like I, I never drank until I was 21. Um, we didn't even have it in my house. And then when I did, like, it took a little time for me for me to figure out what that looked like. So I'll, I, I have been a part of both of those communities. And there's, you know, obviously, like, the Lord's grace and kindness and growth in that. Um, and that's, you know, certainly not a, a struggle in my, not, my life now. But um, but I, I, I think I've seen both what both of those settings can look like. And I, I still think that it's great to be able to gather with friends or at an event or, you know, or so I don't want to like hate on the person who has a drink at a concert. You, you know, obviously shouldn't be drunk at a concert. So let me like, you know, clarify that. But whatever those, you know, those life events are or, um, or, or even just over a table with friends. I think if, again, if we go back to it's not the focal point, it's not like the reason that you come together, but it's something that. Um, sort of enhances, you know, the time that you spend together. And, and it's just something that is fun that you, that you, we get to enjoy. Again, I think we talk about we can enjoy good gifts from God without them, um, without us, you know, c corrupting them or, or abusing them or, or whatever it is. And so um, there's just, I think that's something too. And, and also the community can provide accountability, you know. Mm -hmm. And so if you are out to dinner, you know, if you're going to go out by yourself and, and just drink, my guess is going to be that that's going to end in a much worse place than if you went out with friends for, for whatever it is that you were going out with and shared a drink together where you have other people present who can say, hey, like that, you know, you may be ordering another drink isn't a wise decision, you know, or OK, this, you know, just providing some parameters and some 
some accountability there. Um, as with most things in the Christian life, I think community um, makes uh, and should make things safer and um, and more enjoyable at the same time. And so I think community is a good gift that God has given us that allows us to enjoy things with one another. Um, and, and I think the likelihood of those things being enjoyed in the right way without being abused or without being overdone, um, but still – you know, having fun and celebrating like all of when all those things are swirling together, that can be a really great, good thing. So mm -hmm. I just, that's, I agree completely. Yeah. And I just want to encourage I, and some pastors listen to this and I want to encourage them that to Ashlyn's point the, towards more of the beginning of, of the deep dive that most people in our churches, like most everyday normal folks is not, or they're not like, you know, they don't know about the teetotaler arguments. They're mm -hmm. not, you know, they're not binge, you know, alcoholics either. Uh, this is, this is normal life for people. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're going to really pastor faithfully beyond the choir, you know, beyond just people who are raised in traditional Baptist churches in the South back to reach our community, then we you can't listen to this kind of conversation and immediately write it off. I mean, I, I get, I'm not. I mean, we're we're not doing this just like my word to pastors. We're not doing this segment to be edgy. No, we have no desire to do that. We're saying, look, this is what real ministry looks like because these are the nor normal rhythms of people in your community's life. Like they have beer in their refrigerator, <laughs> right. like they do, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they get a glass of wine when they go to dinner and they have wine at their weddings, you know, and th this is a normal, and, and a lot of and people in your church that have, you know, a little bit of a bourbon sip before they go to bed while it's like their little nightly ritual while they read their book. They won't even do it while they read their Bible. Mm -hmm. th this, so rather than be outraged or try to use this against us down the road, <laughs> this recording or whatever it might be, like we got to navigate what does it look like for the person that it's not even attention for them. It's just a, a a rhythm of their life. Right. And and how do we help them navigate and live in this world? And the answer is not just to have this big, huge sermon on why we should never ever drink alcohol in our entire lives. People are gonna look at you like you have four heads, you know. Unless again, you're preaching to the choir. But rather, what does Christian maturity look like and self control look like? Also, respect and compassion. I think that's really important as we're really trying to care about others. To the point where if you have someone in your life that struggles with alcohol. Mm -hmm. When they come over to your house, it shouldn't even be out right. out of love for that person. That's not legalism. That's called others, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That's called loving your neighbor. Yeah. Uh, things like that. Or just the respect issue. Like, let's say you go uh, to a seminary, a Southern Baptist seminary, that's giving you, you know, the qu equivalent of in-state tuition through our cooperative program, and they have an alcohol policy. Be res Like, mm -hmm. don't be outraged by that. You didn't have to go there. Right. Th those, every school has institutional rules. You know, if you go to the West Point, there's institutional rules, if, right. you know, uh, to anywhere, you know. So, uh, so that, that's what respect looks like, too. If you're, if So I, I think that that's just really important as well is to be for institutions. And institutions have policies everywhere. And if you're going to be part of the institution uh, that requires that, then be mature enough to abide by it and respect, and also have integrity enough to abide by it. And then also at the same time realize uh, that you don't have to answer to other people around the country and other pastors in your town. You answer to the Lord and you answer to your congregation is ultimately who you answer to. So you are you're, so you should not approach it based on what someone might think about you in another place. And it can be costly. So someone might say, then why is it worth it? Why is it worth it? Why? It's not that it's worth it. Like, again, it's not a thing for me. It's a sufficiency of scripture. Go back to it again. Like, I've, I have legitimately had speaking issues, speaking engagements canceled because of my view on alcohol. I did not have my first glass of wine until I was 21 years old. I have never, by God's grace, even been tipsy before in my life, ever. Not one time. Mm -hmm. I don't even like beer. I don't drink beer. <laughs> I don't like mixed drinks. I don't. The li only thing I like is a glass of red wine that I'll normally like. maybe have a glass at home every now and then or when we go out to dinner or something like that. That's it. So because of that, I'm unwise and unfit and uneligible to speak at somebody's conference. I mean, what? <laughs> like, what? What is going on here? It's crazy. And, and so I, I just think that 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 needs. I just think we need to. I, I, so I'm at this convention is never going to change their view on alcohol. It's not going to happen as a collective body uh, of of messengers and those type of things. Right. However, individual people in conversations can give each other grace on an issue that is about personal conviction uh, when it comes to outside of our actual institutions. So one of the things, too, that, that comes to mind as we talk about this is so where where we live in the cultural south in a college town, like, I don't know a, another way to say this other than drinking is very much interwoven into the fabric of, like, community life. And that's probably true everywhere, but it's definitely true here in Tallahassee. And so how are, like, how do you guys think about mission and drinking? And I'm not saying that we're going bar hopping missionally. But 
so often those two things are are so like like hanging out with unbelievers and alcohol being present are very very normal and so how should the christian handle those moments I'm going to tell you what, again, I'm not the guy that thinks like you and people for Jesus by going and sitting in a coffee shop or by drinking beer or anything like that. Uh, that, that makes sense. on like some book about being missional, but it's not, that's just not real life. Uh, I do believe and know that if I was hardcore against alcohol, even being around or whatever it might be, it would severely limit my interactions, my relationships, my connections, uh, my world. I live in of my age group in Tallahassee, uh, my kind of similar, just makeup, demographic, everything. Uh, it is a normal part of, of just gathering dinner conversation. I go to a lot of benefits in town, you know, if just to be with people and connect with people and just relationships. If I, it, it would severely, severely hinder. Uh, so that's where the local church aspect comes in, your local mission. Like what's more mm-hmm. important to you? Being included in something outside of your city, which is nice and, and, and can be enjoyable, or being fully engaged. Mm-hmm. And that's not, you might sound like a false dichotomy. A lot of times it's not when mm-hmm. it comes to this issue in Baptist life. Uh, so, um, so I would say I would say that it's very important yeah. for for us here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a part of Tallahassee life. Not for for some people, yes, yeah, certainly in a bad way, but like in general, I think it's just as with anywhere. Like some people go out and have a drink with dinner or have a drink with a friend. Some people don't, and that's okay. <laughs> like I think we have to, as with so many other things, we have to um, sort of acknowledge that like people can fall on different places of the spectrum obviously for the christian like we don't we don't well we don't want people to fall into sin but but we can we can land on different things so um yeah i mean i I think that if uh, to echo dean's point if, if we were to be like staunchly against it in a way that's like like verbally like comes after people who drink that we would we would really be missing out on reaching um a large part of Tallahassee that desperately needs the gospel. I also think too, that as with so many things, unbelievers, like, I think sometimes we can act like as Christians that we can like outsmart unbelievers and that's just not true. So <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yes. So if I'm going to dinner with, uh, you know, a, a mix of friends and some are Christians and some are not, if I like make it a big deal that I'm like having a glass of wine and that like makes me so cool, like, Nobody cares because people have been drinking wine since the dawn of time. Like that's not a new novel thing. And so sometimes I think as Christians, we're like, you know, I got my cool card on because like I ordered, you know, if if you have to like look around at your whole table for a reaction when you order a drink at dinner, like you need to evaluate yourself. So I think that's something too, where again, alcohol does not like, it doesn't earn us cool points. It, it doesn't, you know, make us, we don't need to like go all in on it because we feel like it makes us a different kind of edgy Christian. Just let it be. If somebody can look at your life and say, you know, that person enjoys friendship and community. And there's someone that I can call and say, Hey, you want to go meet for a drink after work? Or you want to, you know, meet for dinner and maybe there will be wine and maybe there won't, we don't have to like make a pact beforehand about like, we are drinking or no, we're not, you know, like, it's, I think there's like, we put so many parameters around this stuff. And at the end of the day, like, yes, we have to walk in wisdom, but the goal of the Christian life is to become the type, you know, this is, I think I'm calling on a Tim Keller Sherman here. Like the goal is to become the type of people who make wise decisions. And mm. so I don't want to sit down with an unbeliever and be like, hold on, let me pull out my rule book or my guidebook for this situation so that I know how to act. Like my goal is to become a a real person who images the the life of Christ and I'm so far from that and I need so much grace but I I don't want to um you know miss out on relationships with people because I'm afraid of of what other Christians will think and I just don't care about that that's what it is I mean Mm -hmm. that's really what it is and I I I hear things like well it's it's a bad witness and I'm like to whom like like I've never met an unbeliever in my life that thinks that a Christian is not a real Christian because they had a drink of a glass of beer or, or a glass of wine. Now, if you were sloshy drunk, sloshy, is that, is that what? Slosh, sure. Slosh, sure. Slosh, yeah, if you were sloppy, maybe is a better word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or if you're just drunk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, yeah if, if you're drunk and you're doing things that, like the scriptures say, that leads to recklessness, you yeah. know, all of a sudden you're being this over-the-top flirt, you're saying things you shouldn't say, they're inappropriate, making a fool out of yourself. Guess what that is? It's a bad witness. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Sin is a bad <laughs> yeah, witness. Sin is a bad witness. Uh, so uh, I think that, that that old line of, but what about your witness? I've never met an unbeliever that cares. 
No, I've, but, uh, I've had yeah. the opposite experience usually. Not, I mean, not that they're like think I'm cool, but I mean, so m- like m- my wife Melissa, she works as a nurse. Like she's known as like the good Christian lady because she's married to a pastor at work, and we've gone to functions with her coworkers, and like you can see the tension drop if I open a beer. Oh yeah, like, oh totally for me when I go somewhere. Totally. And, and, and and again, now you have to be you have to be careful there because to your point, Ashlyn, about wisdom. Like if if I'm looking for a reaction, if it's like I want to be the cool you know drinking guy who's you know whatever. Like th- there's a there's a pleasing people there that is is unhealthy and and idolatrous in a sense. Like I'm you know if I'm putting more kind of stake in what those people think about me, whether I do or I don't drink, because I could go and I could just drink Diet Coke and I would personally be fine. But there are times where I've made the decision to have a beer that just instantly makes people relax because of what they presuppose to be true about me based on what I do for a living. And so it, it, in some ways, it actually makes connecting with people in those social settings significantly easier because I'm no longer like the guy who's looking down on them because they choose to drink. Uh, and so, I mean, I've seen that time and time again with, with other examples. And so it just it does become... I don't. I mean, it's not a cost of entry to, to have conversations and to get to know people, but in this environment and, and around unbelievers, like, I mean, I, I should be able, like, people should look at me, and I mean, this, I, I think of my, my, like, one of my best friend's bachelor parties, I was the only Christian there, I was the only one who was not sloshy drunk, like, and they all were, like, w- surprised by the fact that I was not drunk, and I was like, this, this shouldn't be that surprising. I'm a Christian. Like I don't I don't do this. They'll be like, dude, it's your bachelor party. And you're like, there's not exception clauses. <laughs> right. <for sin." laughs> exactly. And so, but you know, but that spoke to them because I was different. And so, like, I could handle it responsibly. I didn't have ten beers over the course of four hours. I had two. You know, it was it was different. But it just like it, it created some space to have conversation and to show a different. Now I could have gone and had none, and they wouldn't have thought any less of me. But just, I mean, I don't know. There's just some kind of a, like, oftentimes this, this social pressure just relaxes and they're no longer looking at you as like, are you judging me for what I'm doing? Cause, cause in some ways you're partaking in a way that's not sinful, but, but breaks the ice, I guess, maybe on the, on the topic. Oh, and also I think it's important for people to know that our church has an alcohol policy for our staff. Yeah. Right. We do. It's not, you know, complete abstinence. Mm-hmm. But there, there, ex- there's like there's strong, like very strong, limits. yeah, limits and, and and drunkenness claims. What are, you, what are you cracking open over there, Just Alex? A, 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 Alex? A silver oh bullet, word. diet coke. <laughs> 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 on that was like on theme right there. It was perfect, and, but it's a diet coke, folks. Those of you who are listening, yeah. <laughs> and so, so we take this stuff seriously. Like, please hear this, you know. And you know, for me, I, I had this like this stigma, not in Tallahassee and not in the rest of the world, but in Baptist life, um, which I'm a part of, a very much part of. Of being like the drinking guy, you know, it's funny because again, I haven't even been drunk in my life. I don't even drink beer, <laughs> so. Uh, but because uh, years ago, the Florida Baptist Witness, which at the time was the state Florida Baptist newspaper, mm-hmm. uh, they reached out to me and asked me. They said they're going to do an article on generational differences with Baptist pastors and alcohol. Now, alcohol is very controversial in Baptist life. The fact that there's generational differences is not is, is not controversial. So I was like, okay. Like people know there's generational differences. That doesn't mean that every young person thinks it's fine, and every and I'm not saying, but there are clearly. Yeah, uh, it's, it's it's a thing. So I was like, yeah, that, that's that's safe, you know. Like, what? so I they came over and interviewed me, and it was a very nice conversation. And I just I didn't say anything radical or crazy. I mean, I just kind of gave a basic like what we talked about today. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. and I and so <laughs> what happens? The article comes out, and it's on the front page of the state paper, and it says Tallahassee pastor tolerant when it comes to alcohol. And the whole stinking article is about me <laughs> and my views on alcohol. And I got completely like blacklisted in Florida for a mm-hmm. long time and still am in some places because I just said that it's okay to do it if you don't get drunk and you're of age and you're sensitive towards others. And, yeah. You know, th- th- that kind of, that's really like. So what you're saying is being a tolerant person has has been controversial for longer than the last year or two. This is true. <laughs> yes. Am I the original woke? <laughs> when you it might comes be. To, yeah. Maybe. So, but, it's, but it's really, I mean, to this day, that gets brought up. Like, to this day. And people will go, like, I, I, was, gonna, I was invited to preach at, um, at a friend's church, and another staff member said, wait, isn't that the guy? that?" And then talked about the article. And he was like, dude, that's not a thing. But is it just amazing how it's, so people just, it's just amazing how that, it shouldn't be used as, like, a power grab. Like, a, oh, we got you, or, oh, you're, because of a view, you know, and so, 
th- that's just it's just amazing that this is such a thing yeah and i mean going back to a like a practical real life ministry angle i think your church has to be a place where and this is something more about like the the culture of your church you have people in your church who have struggled with alcohol Mm -hmm. and so your church has to be a place where people can talk about those things on their journey toward christ-likeness you know growth in christ i mean if we can't talk openly about now you don't want to glory none of us ever want to glorify sin right but we have to be able you know in in um community groups and in whatever you know from the pulpit whatever it looks like we have to be able to talk about real things and if you can't touch that because it's just too uncomfortable people ultimately are going to catch that message like again people the the average person is like smart you know like Mm -hmm. we can people are perceptive and and people are gonna be able to feel out this is a place where maybe like me talking openly about some of my most difficult complex sins is not okay and that's not you know we want to be able to bring things into the light and to be able to talk about struggles as opposed to saying I have to you know that's kind of where the joke in Baptist life comes from that like you know all the Baptists, you know, are at the liquor store. You just don't know it, or I don't, I don't. How does that actually yeah, go? Yeah, the Baptists drink. They just do it at home. Or what, something what's like the, like what's like the difference, like a Baptist and Episcopalian? Episcopalians say hello to each other at the liquor store. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 something yeah. like that. So I mean, it's like that, that kind of stuff. Like we joke about it, but it's like, well, that you it's know, sad. It, it's it sad. is sad. Yeah. And so that's where whether you, you know, whatever your view is on alcohol, you want your church to be a place where people can come with who they are and. Um, and, and be able to, to talk about if something really is a a pitfall for them, that that can be a place that a, um, uh, you know, wants to serve them well in that. So doesn't, you know, doesn't encourage them in, in something that, you know, regularly leads towards sinful behavior for them, but, but also a place where somebody can at least just talk about it. Mm -hmm. And, and so I just think that we have to, you know, we have to have enough faith in the gospel, um, and you know, and and in the culture of of our churches to you know be a place where people are comfortable talking about um, just the real things of their life. But again, going back to especially our witness to the unbeliever, and just I mean, really, probably even to each other, people, you know, people can people can look at your whole life and see whether you're a good witness for Christ or not. And that should leave us all with a little bit of fear and trembling, right? So, I mean, people are going to pick up on not just what your view on alcohol, that's that's probably actually for the average unbeliever going to be like down the list of things. You know, people can look at people can look at your life and be around you and see, you know, is that person a gossip? Is that person always condescending? Are they, do they always have, you know, are they always cutting other people down? Do they like fudge things a little bit? Do they have a little bit of like compromised integrity on, you know, financial decisions or in their, in their marriage or in their family life? Like people, you know, I don't, I just think that we can read people, right? And Mm -hmm. so that should make us all a little bit scared regardless of what our view is on alcohol. And I mean like scared in a good way, that should put a weight on us to be, to remind us that, um, the world is watching, and a lot of people have been turned off from from the church or from or have a very confused view of what it means to be a Christian because, you know, again, Christians are not, we are capable of sin. And so we, you know, you kind of have to say back to that, like, yes, we, we need Jesus. That's why, that's why we are Christians and we acknowledge that. So there's always going to be that tension. But I think, you know, we should be mindful of the fact that we can very easily confuse an unbeliever by the way that we live. And so that's just something that I think transcends way beyond, way beyond alcohol, even though that is part of it. Yeah. Our witness is what is not a one issue. Right. Sure. Totally. Totally. The same Jesus who said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven is the same Jesus who turned water into wine. Yeah. Yeah, those things are not at odds with each other, Mm -hmm. and and so I think my encouragement to everyone is: if you have convictions about not drinking alcohol, please don't change them. Yeah, (laughs) like now, now convictions aren't infallible. The scriptures are, so don't change them out of pressure. Yeah, if you're gonna ever change them, change them because you've maybe drawn the conclusion um, that that maybe it's but this phase in your life. This again, but so we hold personal convictions that are kind of extra biblical. We hold those lightly, Mm -hmm. and the things that are the scriptures, like drunkenness, man, we hold them tight as can be, right? So. Uh, I want to, my, my hope for people is that their view of alcohol, not their usage, their their view of alcohol uh, for others is based more on fear of God than it is fear of man. 
And I think that's what's happened in Baptist life that's not allowed to be admitted is that it's so driven by fear of man than it is anything else. Yeah, I think you have to hold the tension of like Romans 13 and Romans 14 as, as we think about this. Yeah, in, that's, a good, that's a good observation. You know? So like we're going to submit to the authorities. We're going to follow the rules of the land. Like we're not going to, you know, just because it's okay to drink in, I don't know what the drinking age in Italy is, but I'm just going to assume it's younger than 21. Um, and, you know, but like if you're in the United States, it's 21. And, and also just because you're on a three-day cruise and the drinking age is, you know, lower, like – that's probably not the best, you know, technically you're following the law of the land maybe, but Plus if you're a high schooler, you shouldn't be at like a senior frogs anyways. Definitely it's not. No- senior <laughs> frogs. <laughs> nothing good. Let me tell you, nothing good will come out of that. Speaking at, from at, experience. No, I didn't go in high school, but I have <laughs> at, any age, at any age. At any age. Senior frogs, just say no. Um, <laughs> exactly. But, That's ta- Let that be your takeaway from the podcast. At the, at the same time, you know, Romans 14, like somebody who's weak in the faith or stronger in the faith or who has differing opinions, like don't bind the conscience of another because of your, you know, I forget what you, you called it, uh, like second tier convictions or something. I forget how you worded it, but those, I don't the, remember now. Yeah. Those <laughs> things that we're holding, holding more loosely, like we don't need to bind the conscience. We also, you know, it says don't, don't allow another brother to, you know, to stumble. And so that goes to the point of, you know, somebody who's maybe struggled with alcohol, like, Going to a brewery is probably not the best place to meet that person. Go to a coffee shop instead. Uh, so I, I think like all of that, as we think about kind of the scriptures and think about the way that we apply this issue to life in general, are really good kind of guiding, you know. And and from the thoughts. more from the more kind of traditionalist fundamentalist point, like kind of perspective, it's like, so we are you know losing a generation by the minute, mm-hmm. and you have so many young pastors who are standing in the gap, you know, for serious biblical issues. And on um, exclusivity of Christ, on sexuality, on you just name and go on and on and on. They're pro life. I mean, <laughs> they're like really standing in the gap, yeah. getting arrows from everywhere. And rather than encourage them and include them, you're going to make alcohol a thing. You know, it's like what in the world? <laughs> so the other side of that is, if you're like a church planner, kind of young guy getting rolling, don't flaunt it. You don't make, don't make, don't go on the other end. Don't make it such a thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and also if you're under the NAM funding, then you need to go by, by the American policy. Mission Board and you need to go by that yeah. you know, be respectful of integrity and also be grateful for the institution that's allowing you to do this you know to plant and to help you and so I think it goes all the way back to maturity all around yeah. maturity and self-control as we uh, kind of wind down and shift to the local on tap um, that's a great name for this segment because we're going to talk about if we were to be inclined to go get a drink somewhere in Tallahassee with friends uh, where would you go and what would you get? Maybe. My, my favorite place to get a glass of wine, because I'm again not a beer guy, you know, not, I don't, I don't, no, not a mixed drink guy, um, would be Clusters and Hops. Good spot. Good oh. spot. Um, I would probably, right now, I would probably say Table 23 is like one of my go to favorites, just because they have like a great, like this huge porch and it's just kind of fun environment. And so that's a good place, especially in the summer when you can like sit inside or outside. Um, it's just a fun place to, to go and meet a friend and I'll usually get a cocktail and yeah, yeah it's a good time. Good. And let it be known that Ashley and I's choices also serve food. Yes, they do. So we're not just like chilling at the bar. They're restaurants right. that also happen to serve. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Get yourself a cheese board. <laughs> nah. It's all good. <laughs> in fairness, I'm going to say proof brewing company, uh, it's a local brewery in town. They also have food now though. Rumors. So, rumors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can get food there. It's, <laughs> it's not the primary purpose, but they do offer food. Um, but now yeah, local brewery, uh, it's a great, they got a great outdoor space. Um, if you're, you know, I haven't actually done this, but you can bring your dog uh, or you used to be able to, I don't know what like, extra, I don't know what COVID, <laughs> you know, has done to all of that, but Tallahassee has um, got some good local, local breweries. Yeah, several. They do. And a great place to be, and there's people there. Yes. And for people in this town congregate, if you want to be in the community with people, that's not the only way, but it no. is a great. I mean, it's a great place to go to connect yeah. with people and yeah. be in relationships. I think every time I've gone, I've seen church members. Yeah, uh, you know, and because like Ashlyn said at the beginning, that's that's where that's they are. Their normal yeah. life. Yeah, that's, yeah. Where, that's life where they are. So, good times. Uh, we've probably offended somebody and hopefully enlightened somebody as well. But uh, this has been a good time talking about all things alcohol. We'd love for you to uh, continue the conversation with us on Instagram and Twitter at the Local Dive Pod. Make sure to subscribe and leave a review if you haven't done that as well. And and we will see you next week for another episode of The Local Dive. Don't drink and drive.
Thanks for listening to The Local Dive, a podcast diving into deep and shallow musings about Christ, the church, and culture. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow The Local Dive on social media and continue the conversation with us on Instagram and Twitter at The Local Dive Pod.